So in Olber's paradox, it's important to talk about, well, how the idea came up. Now remember I said he wasn't the first one to come up with it, but let's just, I mean, let's just assume he did write it and talk about it. I mean, he did. Uh, he's just sort of the one who made it famous. So uh, how do we come up with the notion that the sky should be bright? I mean, that seems really like a strange uh, thing or a strange conclusion. So maybe let's start by looking at, okay, well, this is the... Let's actually start with an assumption, maybe. So the assumption is the following. Okay, we're going to assume, using Newton's assumptions here, Newton's assumptions, we're going to say, well, assume then that the stars, we're going to assume that they're evenly distributed. In other words, they're found at you know, equal distances apart. And we're going to sort of take Newton's uh, assumptions and sort of go with them. So we're going to assume that they're evenly distributed, and we're going to assume that there's uh, an infinite number of thin shells. And we're going to do this in order to sort of deal with one thing, and then we're going to see what happens when we include all of them. Um, maybe we could say it's like the layers of an onion. Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. So we're going to see this sort of, this is the first sort of thing here. So we're going to look at this and try to maybe do a diagram. So let's just draw, or maybe let's draw the Earth. So here's the Earth here. Here we are on Earth. What we're going to do then is we're going to look out and see, okay, well, let's, let's look at a shell. What I mean by shell, this is, of course, a three-dimensional sphere here. So it's hard to sort of draw this right here. But, uh, I mean, we could sort of... I think you could sort of try to make something look, you know, sort of like this right here. You know, sort of that's like a three-dimensional shell here. Now, of course, this shell has a certain thickness. Okay, so it's going to have some sort of thickness like this. And like I said, this is in 3D, so it's a little bit hard for me to draw in 3D. I'm not a very good artist. Whoops, whoa. That end little part of the shell is supposed to be the same thickness, so clearly I'm not drawing it very well. There's a reason why I'm not in art school. Here we go. So if we try to sort of connect this here, we're going to assume that this is, uh, you know, this is a shell here. Now inside this shell, we're going to draw a whole bunch of stars. Okay, lots and lots of stars. And they're going to be evenly distributed. This becomes sort of a nice way to deal with things. In fact, this is sort of a calculus trick. You've heard of calculus before. We often do this when we're trying to figure out the total result. We just look at what happens with a small shell, and then we sort of try to figure out what happens there, and then we do what's called integrating, which means we basically add up all the effects of all the things everywhere. So let's just deal with this shell here. So this shell, we're going to say, well, it has a radius r. So from here to here, you know, the radius, the distance here is going to be r, you know, from the center out to here. Each of these are here are stars, and we're going to assume it has a thickness. So maybe I'll sort of draw like this right here. So this thickness right here, has to have a thickness, we'll call it delta r, you know, for like a change. So we're going to say that this is a shell, and there it is, it has a thickness r. This is a 3D shell, though, keep that in mind. Okay, so it's hard to draw in three dimensions, but that's the key. And I'd like you to try to remember something. We've looked at this before, that remember that the apparent brightness of one particular star, so maybe I'll actually write brightness of a star, I'll actually use this, this symbol right here for a star. So brightness of a star. Uh, and that's given by a luminosity divided by the 4 pi times the distance squared. In this case, the distance is going to be r squared. So the key thing to look at then is this. The key conclusion is that the apparent brightness, in other words, what we receive at Earth, on Earth, I mean, remember, this is the apparent brightness. This is actually what we detect on Earth. The apparent brightness on Earth um, due to one particular star then is going to be proportional to just 1 over the distance squared. We write this proportional because we don't really care too much about the luminosity or the 4 pi. We're basically saying, okay, this is going to be something important. We're going to use this later. Okay, so this right here is going to be something important here. Uh, maybe I can use something to denote that it's even more important than uh, just normal here. What could I do? I could put little colors around it, maybe. Oh, that's really ugly. Oh, well. 
All right, so that's the key thing we get, that the brightness from one particular star is proportional to 1 over r squared. That's what we want. Now let's go a little bit further then. Let's see sort of what this does for us. So next, um, let's see here. What I want to do is, maybe what we'll do is we'll count. So let's count um, the number of stars in one shell. So we're going to try to figure out how many stars there are in each shell. So let's count the number of stars in one shell. Okay, so if we go back here to this diagram, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at in here, let's count the number of stars in here. Well, if we look at that then, what we can do is we can say, well, first of all, we need the volume of a shell. I mean, that's what's needed first. So the volume, maybe I'll do this in blue or something. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Here we go. So the volume of a shell. Remember now, we have this whole thing where it's going like this. Remember the diagram here. Some sort of shell like this right here of a certain thickness here. Right? So there's some, this is a distance r, and a thickness over here, that right there is delta r. That's the key thing to remember. So how do you find the volume of a shell? This is three dimensions. Uh, and if you know that, what we have to do is, well, let's take first of all what the surface area is of this, and then we'll multiply that by the thickness. And the th surface area of a three-dimensional shell is given by 4 times pi times r squared. So 4 pi r squared, that right there, maybe I'll do it in a different color. That right there is the surface area, I'll write SA for surface area, of a spherical shell. That's where this comes from. Okay, so surface area of a spherical shell. And we have to multiply that by the thickness, delta r. Because that's how we would get a volume. We get sort of the area times how thick this is. So the volume of the shell is 4 pi r squared times delta r. I suppose I can remove the little dot here. So it's 4 pi r squared delta r. That is the volume of a shell. Now, of course, then, the question might be, uh, you know, how many stars? So what we want to do here is look at how many stars are in that particular volume. I mean, that's the next thing we might want to know, right? We know the volume. Well, how many stars are in that volume? And that actually depends on something that maybe we can call it a, a density. Basically, it's the density of stars. So I'm going to call that rho. That's a symbol. That's a Greek symbol that's usually given to density. And that would be the stars per unit volume. Okay, so if we know the number of stars per unit volume, we would say that that would be uh, rho. And if we know that, then we could say so the total number of stars, this is actually what we're looking for. We're looking for this right here, the number of stars. So n, which is the number of stars in that shell, will be equal to, well, the volume of the shell times the number of stars per volume. If you look at the units, it's because volume and volume would cancel out, and we'd have number instead. So what do we have to work with here? Well, the volume is 4 pi r squared delta r, that's the volume. And this number per volume, that's actually given by the density. So this right here would be the number of stars in one shell. Okay, so that's what we can say. So n equals 4 pi r squared delta r times rho. This right here is something important. Okay, so we can say that this, this right here, maybe I'll do the same colors as we did before here. And have some weird sort of ugly color here. There we go. So that tells us then that the number of stars in one shell is equal to this. Okay, so now we figured out basically, if we go back to this diagram here, we figured out then in one three-dimensional shell of a certain, you know, distance away, of a certain thickness, that the number of stars that you're going to find in here is going to be equal to 4 times pi times the distance squared times the thickness times the density of stars. Okay, well what does this help us with? 
Well, the next thing we can do, I mean, this may seem a bit convoluted, but I think it's important to take it sort of step by step. And now I wonder, what is uh, the apparent brightness from all the stars in that shell? So what is the apparent brightness from all the stars in that shell? So if we talked about back here, oh, there's a question mark here. So back here we said, okay, in one of these, you know, arbitrary shells here that we were looking at, you know, these had little stars all over the place. I'm trying to draw little stars here. If these are all the stars, now this is the number of stars, but we want to know what's the effect of those stars. Now those stars are going to give us an apparent brightness that we can detect. So uh, this is actually important here. Maybe we should talk about the apparent brightness. That's going to be B. That's going to be this letter right here. Apparent brightness is going to be B. Uh, and we're going to call it shell. So apparent brightness of a shell. So the apparent brightness of a shell is going to be, well, it's not equal to, but it'll be proportional to your number of stars in that shell. So that's going to be the 4 pi. Let's go back here to make sure we have the right number. So 4 pi r squared delta r rho. So 4 pi r squared delta r times rho. But it's also going to depend on the brightness from each star. See, so this one right here then, remember what we said about this, that the brightness um, from one particular star, so each star has an apparent brightness that depends on 1 over r squared. So see, what we have to do is, this is the number of stars, so we have to sort of multiply by the, um, by the effect of each of them. So this is the number of stars, so we have to look at the apparent brightness of each star. So that means it would be like multiplying by 1 over r squared. So this one right here, so here came from, just to make it clear where everything came from, this one here came from b of one particular star. And this one right here, that comes from the number of stars in one shell. So the number of stars in one particular shell is this. And if we want the brightness of the entire shell, well, it's you know proportional to this times this. Now there's something really interesting and sort of important that happens. If I say that the brightness of all the stars in one particular shell is proportional to, in other words, sort of depends on this, there's something interesting that happens. This r squared here cancels out that r squared. Therefore, this is the key thing here, the brightness, in other words, the apparent brightness due to one shell only depends on 4 and pi and the delta r and the rho. Now this is the sort of biggest thing right here that we can do. Now it doesn't maybe seem like it's a big deal, but it's a huge deal this one. So maybe I'll even put stars by it. So what in the world does this mean? What this means is that the apparent brightness, in other words, sort of the light that we receive on Earth due to just one shell, that does not depend on the distance away. So that's sort of the, the key thing right here to get. Okay, the key thing is that. So maybe I'll write it down here. I think it's, it's really important here. So the brightness of one shell does not depend on the distance you are. So this is the sort of, oh my god, that's actually a big deal. Now the reason it's a big deal is this. Well, and what it tells us then is that we're going to try to sort of add up the effect of all the shells. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to do here. We're going to sort of add up the effect of all the shells. This is the idea behind it. So to add up the effect of all the shells. Now my computer's going a little bit slow here. There we go. So what we do then is we add up all the different effects of all the different shells. Now I told you that the apparent brightness that we receive from one particular shell is not depending on the distance away you are. 
And now if you're going to do this purely from a calculus base, then you would have to basically integrate then from zero to infinity of some sort of function, uh, depending on r, but the function doesn't have any r's in it. So what that really means is that when you add up the effect of all the shells, you end up that the brightness, sort of the, we could say the total, the total apparent brightness then equals infinity. This is the sort of mind-blowing thing here. Okay, what this means then is that if you add up the effect of all the apparent brightness here, you end up with infinity. Now what this sort of means is that, let's say we have this diagram again with Earth here, and let's say we're looking at you know some distance over here, let's say some distance right here, something that's sort of relatively close. This right here we might say has a small r, you know, it has a small sort of distance away, that could be r right there. So this one right here might have a small r, but if we think about the number of stars in it, then it'll have a small number of stars, but each star uh, has a large apparent brightness due to that particular star. But that means that if you add up, though, the total apparent brightness received from the entire shell, I mean, think about it, you don't have, you don't have many stars in this particular shell that can fit in it, but each star is close by, so that means they have a large apparent brightness due to each star. So the effect of having not many stars, but each of them has a large apparent brightness, that's going to be one thing. But if we compare that to maybe um, another distance away, maybe a larger R here, maybe this one right here. I'm trying to draw another sphere here that didn't work very nice. But this one over here, we have a large R, which means we have a larger number of stars. But each star has a small B star. In other words, each star has a small apparent brightness due to that particular star. So you see what happens is, although it seems like there should be a big difference, there's not really. What I mean by that is that over here we have, although in a small little radius right here, we have a small radius, a few stars, not many of them, but each of them is fairly bright because they're close, the total effect is going to be sort of one certain value. Okay, now I'm not sure what that value is, but let's just assume it's like 5, like 5 uh, watts per meter squared. Well, what that means is that over here in a larger distance away, yes, we have lots more stars that can fit in that shell, right, because it goes out further, but each star has a smaller apparent brightness. And that means the total effect of that will be the exact same as the effect over here. In other words, if this was 5 watts per meter squared, so would this be. And that means when you add up the effect of an infinite number of shells, well, you have that same number just added up. So you'd have like 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5, an infinite number of times. So what do you get? That the apparent brightness due to all of the shells, due to all of the stars and all of the shells, should be infinite. So that is sort of the, the big thing here. Okay? What this essentially tells you then is that, going back to this original thing, what that tells you is no matter where you look, you should be sort of catching some light from each star. Now clearly this cannot be the case, right? I mean, we know that this is, this is false. So that's why this is called Olber's paradox, right? And that's just because of this right here. So the end result is this. Therefore, sky should be bright at night. That's really what this means. Now, obviously, there's, there's something wrong here. Obviously, this is not the case, but that's exactly why it's a paradox. Okay, so this right here, this is the key thing right here. This is probably the sort of key result. All right, it's this right here. So that's, that's the paradox, right? Using Newton's assumptions, you end up with the fact that no matter where you look, you should end up seeing some light. In other words, the night sky should be bright at night, right? And that's because the total effect of all the stars, of all the different shells, should be infinity. So obviously this is not the case, so in the next video we're going to just quickly uh, fly through some of the ideas behind what could be the case, what could be really happening.